rapid uh, mitigation. And uh, of course, this is this language is across uh, the you know many multiple COP decisions from Glasgow to uh, Sharm El Sheikh, and uh, you know across the uh, other uh, uh, plurilateral uh, forums as well. Nevertheless, uh, you know, the real crux of the issue and, and the most clear aspect of climate science is that the world has a limited carbon budget. You have a linear relationship between global surface mean temperature rise and cumulative emissions. And what that means in uh, easily understandable policy terms is that the world has a limited global carbon budget. This is a finite amount for a certain probability of limiting warming to either 1.5 or 1.7 or 2 degrees Celsius. And this science has been clear for over a decade. Uh, it, you know, it was first put together in the fifth assessment report, in fact, very, very clearly. However, developed countries refused to speak about the carbon budget. Uh, there is, a, you know, there is a there is a little reference to it in the in in uh, the COP26 decision, uh, passing reference, if you may. Uh, so the, the the refusal also extends to, of course, uh, the refusal to acknowledge that uh, there has been a highly inequitable uh, use of the global carbon budget so far. There are huge historical resp responsibility of developed countries, but the this aspect which is the most clear and robust science, the best, in fact, the best available science, is never put on the table. Uh, you don't want to discuss it. What developed countries want to discuss is, of course, a focus on 1.5 degrees Celsius, having done nothing to limit warming to 1.5. We're already at 1.1 degrees Celsius. You, the focus is increasingly on 1.5. And the focus is on reduction of emissions by 43% by 2030, peaking of uh, emissions by 2025. Now you have, uh, of course, net zero by 2050 is also part of it, tripling of uh, global RE capacity by 2030, and doubling of energy efficiency. These are new targets that have been added in the last year to the entire list of global targets. So you have global targets. You have nationally determined contributions to, uh, to mitigation. And so you have a, a bottom-up uh, architecture of the Paris Agreement. Yet you have a global collective goal that you need to meet. And uh, that, ha that should be scientifically quantified in terms of what is the carbon budget and you know, how then should we use the carbon budget that is remaining, a very little bit of it that is remaining. However, that is not on the table. And all of these are. So what do these, these mean? The challenge, of course, is very clear. Uh, the Annex 1 parties, which uh, constitute about 19% of the global emissions, are responsible for 81%, uh, um, uh, sorry, 68% of the historical CO2 emissions, whereas the non-Annex 1 uh, parties, which are 81% of the global population, are responsible only for 32% of the historical emissions till 2019. Right? And so four-fifths of the carbon budget for limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is already exhausted. For two degrees Celsius, this number is two-thirds. So these numbers are in the IPCC, although they are not stated, uh, you know, the historical shares are not stated as clearly in terms of developed and developing countries. Because you have developed countries refusing to now also want to speak of developed and developing countries. They want to break down this differentiation uh, and not speak about uh, the, the convention that talks about uh, annex, the Annex 1 and the non-Annex 1 parties. Um, but the, the fact that four-fifths of this budget is exhausted is very much a part of even the summary for policymakers in the IPCC, although it's not part of the IPCC outreach. Now, why it's not part of the IPCC outreach is, uh, uh, of course, uh, something, a question that perhaps the IPCC needs to be asked. Uh, but uh, if you actually look at what's happened between 1990 and 2020 also, and this is after uh, the convention, uh, after the developed, countries part, developed country parties agreed to take the lead in mitigation, a very clear direction, the non-EIT Annex 1 parties have emitted about 419 gigatons of CO2, that is, this is without accounting for uh, Lulu CF land use and land use change uh, emissions. So about 419 gigatons. And that's, if we, if we think about it, the remaining carbon budget from 2020 onwards, according to the IPCC, is 500 gigatons. So just in these 30 years, just the non-EIT Annex 1 parties have emitted uh, 419. The Annex 1 as a whole has emitted more than this the remaining carbon budget uh, that is there for the entire world for the foreseeable future till we reach net zero. So that's quite a significant lack of 
uh, any kind of effort in the decades between 1990 to 2020. To 2020. And this is why developing countries speak about pre-2020 pledges. You can't talk about the fact that you are uh, that you need urgent action for 1.5 without talking about why is it that you need urgent action today. We wouldn't have needed urgent action if we weren't at 1.1 degrees Celsius already. So but the fact that you have such very less carbon budget left is a reason why we are under so much pressure today. So 47% of these emissions without Lulu CF come from the Annex 1 in this, these three decades when they were supposed to take the lead. And the population uh, uh, contribution across these three decades is around 18 to 19%. So it continues to be disproportionate, uh, their contribution to the cumulative emissions. The reduction in, uh, so let's, let me take one target at a time that, is, that, 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 that has been uh, proposed and pushed, especially by developed countries. It's already a part of uh, two COP decisions, but let's talk about what it actually means on the ground. What does this 43% mean? Where does this number come from? Why 43%? Why not 42%? Why not 45%? Why not 46? Why 43? It seems like an odd number to put out there. And so this number comes from, it's, it's the median value of the global model pathways that have been assessed by the IPCC's sixth assessment report. Right? So these are scenarios that the IPCC assesses. It assesses, there are, there are uh, about over 2,400 scenarios submitted to the IPCC. They apply some criteria of which they've shortlisted uh, about 1,202 scenarios. And then uh, they categorize these scenarios by what kind of temperature rise they imply. Mm -hmm. And then, so let's say you take the 1.5 degrees Celsius scenarios. These are about uh, 97 scenarios. 1.5 degrees Celsius without, with, with, uh, with no or limited overshoot. So there's no overshoot to one, uh, from 1.5. You limit warming to 1.5 in, uh, uh, in this century. And then um, uh, with a 50% probability, right? So those 97 scenarios, the median of those scenarios tells you that you need a 43% reduction. However, uh, these scenarios, if you look at what the underlying assumptions are of these scenarios, there's very high reduction in developing countries that is assumed even in the near term. The long term, of course, uh, developing countries also have to contribute, but even in this decade, it's assumed that developing countries have extremely high contribution to uh, uh, mitigation. Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, is expected to reduce emissions by 80% in this decade, whereas North America and Europe are expected to re reduce emissions only by 50%. 50% is what they've said they would do in their NDCs, which we've all talked about, about how inadequate this is. But the IPCC scenarios, the assessed scenarios by the IPCC, doesn't require anything more from the developed countries than the developed countries themselves say they will do. So as inadequate as these uh, targets are, the IPCC doesn't require anything additional from them. Whereas from Sub-Saharan Africa, which is already one of the lowest emitters, extremely low uh, current emissions, has to reduce 80% from in this decade, uh, in, uh, you know, in these scenarios, in this sort of the median scenario that we've taken. Of course, there are, uh, there's a, a, you know, a lot written about how much carbon dioxide removal is, uh, is assumed in these scenarios. Sometimes in some scenarios, the amount of removal is even more than the remaining carbon budget itself. And a large majority of this, in most scenarios, over 70% of this uh, removal is supposed to come from developing countries, largely from uh, Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? And there are, of course, uh, quite a few uh, papers already written and also assessed by the IPCC that show that some of these most stringent pathways have extremely high uh, uh, negative consequences for food security. So you currently have a, uh, the risk, the number of people at risk of hunger is reducing. But uh, under some of these, the most stringent 1.5 degrees Celsius scenarios, the number of people at risk of hunger is going to increase. Uh, because of land-based mitigation that is assumed in these scenarios and carbon dioxide removal through CCS, uh, you know, bio uh, energy, carbon capture and sequestration. So the Global South is supposed to convert its food crops to energy crops and then use these energy crops for, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, combustion and then capture that carbon and sequester it. So eventually we will provide the negative emissions that are required to sustain fossil fuel emissions, oil and gas use in the developed world. Uh, but alternative scenarios are possible. And here we've done a simple exercise in terms of 
you know, if you just take the IPCC scenarios, that median scenario, and adhere to the budget, to the carbon budget that it implies, we know that it's 500 gigatons of CO2, uh, you can have alternative scenarios. So for example, this first uh, set of bars is the, uh, the 1.5 C1 IPCC scenarios. It has a total implied cumulative emissions till net zero, so carbon budget of 486 gigatons. And the CO2 emissions in 2050 are 3.3 gigatons, right? But if you look at how much the Annex 1, which is shown in red, is expected to do, it's 43% reduction. The non-Annex 1 together, it's 45% reduction. It's the non-Annex 1 together is expected to do much more. And if you dig down further, you'll see that, uh, of course, you know, Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to do the most uh, through land-based mitigation. But we've constructed alternative scenarios where, for example, you have, uh, uh, you know, 96% reduction in the Annex 1 uh, countries. And for the 1.5 degrees Celsius targets, there is no way that developing countries get even a little bit more space, even a which, which is not their fair share. It's still not their fair share, but a little bit more than what the IPCC affords them. If you need this, there is no other way but for developed countries to reduce all that they tell the rest of the world to do. Immediate reductions, sustained reductions, rapid reductions right now in this critical decade are in fact required from the developed countries. And then you have a little more space while still remaining within the carbon budget. This is another alternative with even higher reductions for Annex 1, providing a little bit of increase, 9% increase or 12% increase. It still means that uh, develop, developing countries have to peak and start reducing very soon because there's very little room left for 1.5 degrees Celsius. But it's still a little more equitable than what the IPCC scenarios say. So the 43% number is not sacrosanct. And this entire idea that this somehow constitutes the best available science is at best, uh, you know, is... I mean, in my opinion, I mean, I would be very frank, I don't think it is the best available science. I mean, it's very easy to do alternative scenarios, uh, you know, in, by just, you don't need an entire IPCC authors team to do it. it two people sitting in uh, uh, one corner of India can do it, right? So it's, uh, so uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's something that they could have done, but did not do. Uh, for two degrees Celsius, there is a little more room. Again, here you have a lot of uh, burden the, the ex extra budget that you have for two, two degrees Celsius is allocated in these IPCC scenarios to the Annex 1 countries. So they get to reduce a little uh, you know, slower even in the two degrees Celsius scenarios. But here, of course, a little more room is available to non-Annex 1 uh, countries if Annex 1 uh, countries reduce rapidly even in the two degrees Celsius scenarios. Peaking of emissions by, uh, in 2025. It's only with very high Annex 1 emissions reductions reaching net zero by the early 2030s do developing countries get even a little bit of room to peak a little later. Right? So this 2020 to 2025 peaking that is uh, typically, that is being pushed by developed countries again comes from these IPCC scenarios, which assumes that uh, it's simply a result of lower burdens on Annex 1 countries. If you burden Annex 1 countries more in these scenarios, develop, uh, developing countries won't have to peak by 2025. They can peak a little later, not very much later, even in the alternatives. Because again, like I said, if you, and, and you know, we are scientists in the, in the global south, whatever it is, uh, even if we are talking about equity, we understand that we need to limit warming uh, we need to address climate change and climate change mitigation. And therefore, we need to adhere to science. And science tells us that we, need, we have a very limited carbon budget, right? So, uh, so peaking does not get too much delayed, and this is an illustration of that. So, for example, if you see these two lines, uh, the Annex 1 IPCC line is a solid red line, and the slightly lighter red line is the alternative, which is a much higher reduction for Annex 1. Uh, for the IPCC line, non-Annex 1 also reduce immediately. But of course, in the alternative, you can have slightly delayed peaking. But again, like you see, it's not too much beyond 2030. The peaking doesn't get delayed too much beyond 2030. The global uh, scenarios also look a little different. Again, in the 2 degrees Celsius, there's a little more room. But with rapid Annex 1 reductions, non-Annex 1 can get a little more room, but will have to peak and reduce at some point just a little later. And the global scenarios look the same. 
So for the glo same global scenarios, you can have different underlying regional distributions. Right? And that, of course, is not something that is brought out by the IPCC at all. Uh, this is a fair share uh, calculation. And if you see, this is a very uh, interesting, sorry. This is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, graph, and I don't think the laser is working. But uh, you see the uh, uh, solid red line is the actual emissions, historical emissions of Annex 1 countries. The dotted red line is the fair share of Annex 1 countries. And the distance, the gap between the two continues to remain almost constant historically as well as in the future. This is 1851 to 2050. That gap remains constant. So even, so in the past, of course, they have been uh, emitting much more than their fair share. But in the IPCC projections for the future also, they will keep emitting more than their fair share. Right? And, and uh, similarly, a non-Annex 1 countries are projected to keep emitting below their fair share even in the future, just as uh, they have been emitting lower than their fair share in the past. In the alternatives, you, you get a little bit of a difference, but not much, because there's very little space left to provide a really equitable solution anymore. The tripling global RE capacity, uh, again, we, this is almost five minutes. Five minutes yeah. So I have just two more targets to go, and I'll, I'll stop with those targets, and I won't go to the uh, won't spend too much time on the just transition. So uh, the global RE capacity by 2030, uh, this is almost, it's become passe. Everybody is talking about it. Uh, you know, it's okay. Everybody can do it. But it's one thing to promise things, uh, put something on paper, even if in COP decisions or pledges. And another thing to actually deliver it on the ground. And once you start uh, building these capacities and delivering these on these pledges on the ground is where the trouble really starts and uh, the challenges really uh, start to emerge and and that, that's why you know if you see the history of what has happened in the in the negotiations and of uh, what the annex one uh, countries have done is actually a history of promises that keep changing the goalpost. You promise something for 2012, then you promise something for 2020, then you promise something for 2030, and now you've promised something for 2050, and you don't implement any of those promises. So when it actually comes to implementation, it doesn't work. And so the, the question about this global RE capacity, the real question to ask is, where is this capacity going to be built? Right? The electricity demand is uh, highly variant across uh, developed and developing regions. Developed countries don't have very high growth in demand. Developing countries have much higher growth in demand to catch up with their development needs, building infrastructure, building schools, roads, hospitals, housing, etc. All of that requires higher uh, energy. So you're capital scarce countries, so they're going to have higher energy demand growth in the near term. So if, you, if the US actually retains its existing fossil fuel capacity, it will require only 26 gigawatts to meet its additional demand. Right? So unless the tripling target goes hand in hand with a phase out of fossil fuels in the developed countries, a large chunk of the burden of this tripling RE capacity is going to fall on developing countries. Because that's where the new capacity is going to be needed. Right? So, so, so this has to, so it's not simply enough to say a triple global RE capacity. That target has to go hand in hand with saying that in, developing, in developed countries, this must be a replacement of existing fossil fuel capacity so that they actually meet a fair share of that tripling target as well. Uh, there's going to be other challenges, of course. China, for example, already has an installed capacity of 1,200 gigawatts. So if you're growing from a very low baseline, it's one thing. But if you're, if you're tripling from already high capacities, that's a, that's a significantly high. So, so uh, the 2030 target, if you just apply this nationally, the tripling target for China would be to install, have as much installed renewable energy capacity as there is globally today, right, in eight years. So that's quite a big ask for, for, from any one country. Right? So if it, you have a national tripling, those with higher levels of RE already have to do even more. If you have global tripling, the question of where will this additional capacity come from, where will it be added, remains an, an unanswered question currently. And the last target is the energy efficiency target. Now this is, a, um, this is an interesting one. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of my favorite uh, topics, but I don't have time anymore to uh, get into the details of it. But, the, but energy efficiency is typically calculated at the firm level, right? But at the national level, the proxy that is used is the energy by GDP ratio. So how much energy do you need to produce one unit of GDP? 
Now, if you actually look at the US, what has happened is that their energy intensity has reduced by 58% between 1965 and 2018. So for every unit of GDP produced, the US has become more efficient. Part of this is because of the movement from manufacturing to the services sector. Part of it is because of improved technology, et cetera. But their fossil fuel CO2 emissions have increased by 58% in this period. So an energy efficiency target doesn't guarantee a reduction in emissions. So what is an energy efficiency target doing, at a climate, uh, doing in climate talks? Because our main uh, target has to be emissions reductions. And so a doubling of energy efficiency really uh, doesn't guarantee this. It is also a factor of development, right? Countries tend to have higher and increasing trends in energy efficiency, uh, energy intensity at a certain stage of development. When you have small and medium sector enterprises, for example, small industry informality in production, it's much harder to achieve uh, energy efficiency. It's much harder, harder to use new technology, improve technology. You have capital constraints. But when, once you achieve scale, it becomes easier. So the question remains, again, who is going to be burdened if those with currently high levels of energy intensity, are they going to be expected to do more to achieve this energy efficiency target? Which means those with, for example, uh, you know, small, uh, medium scale industries, etc., are going to be going to find it much more challenging. So, actual implementation challenges of these targets—they might look great on paper, but uh, you know, I think if we, if we keep talking about this critical decade and uh, we are in the phase of implementation, it's high time we start deconstructing some of these targets and start talking about what are the real challenges that uh, actually emerge especially in the, in, in the context of uh, meeting equity, meeting all of these targets equitably, uh, either in this decade or the next decade or in the foreseeable future. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Tejal. Is this mic on? Yes. Um, I'm so sorry that we had to constrain your budget in time. But uh, the equity perspective was absolutely important. So when you hear developing countries, some developing countries pushing back on the global targets, it's not because they are not ambitious, but it's because it is actually against equity. Um, without further ado, let me invite Andres Mogro, a good friend also um, of the Global South from Ecuador. And he has been a finance expert. Um, Dr. Tejal has been talking about the mitigation side of things. We are all in this global stock take process. Talk about the finance goal and talk about this 2.1C and the new collective quantified goal on finance and the loss and damage fund. Now you have about 15 minutes on rest to do all that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mina, and good evening, everyone. It's always great to follow Dr. Tajal. Uh, we were in the side event by, by, by Third World Network in Bonn as well, and, and her insights are always eye-opening. They feel like, instead of taking notes, it, it's difficult to take notes because it feels like a bucket of cold water thrown <laughs> on your head. And I remember that the, the, the one conclusion that she also reached when she presented to us the, the, the IPCC scenarios in Bonn was that the scenarios consider the, the, the least costly and, and, the, and the more efficient way to reach our targets. And in many cases, those ways involve developing countries' standards of life staying with they, where they are and, and developed countries' standards of life not moving away from where they are. So it's, it's cheaper for the poor to remain poor and for the rich to remain rich to reach our targets than for any of that to change. And that's a complex scenario to begin from. And that is sadly also something that is reflected on the, fin on the finance agenda. And I want to begin with a similar reflection than the one that she closed with. She said, what does energy efficiency have to do with mitigation? And in the finance conversations, sadly, finance, climate finance has also very little to do with climate action. Because the way in which finance is being accounted for currently, of course, and the goals that we've, we're putting out and then the pledges that we're putting out, they're, they're all measured in US dollars. But 
most of the flows that are being channeled towards developing countries have no idea of their climate impact. They have no idea even whether or not there is any climate impact. So we have investments on energy efficiency or renewable sources or anything related to water or agriculture, of course, will be, will be reflected as, as, as adaptation finance. But none of that have anything to show for themselves in terms of impacts, in terms of CO2 emissions reduced or vulnerability reduced or resilience raised. And I wanted to begin with that, with that reflection. Now, Mina has asked me to do something very difficult, probably impossible to do, which is to talk about the loss and damage fund, NCQG, 21C, and, and, and everything, and she's given me now only 10 minutes remaining. But before I go into those specifics, I also want to compare what it is that we've agreed within the process in terms of decisions, what guidelines we have from the Paris Agreement in terms of finance commitments, and what's happening in practice, and I'll begin we're doing that just very quickly. In terms of what the Paris Agreement, what this process says officially on finance, and I say officially because in practice it, it, it works differently, sadly. Um, officially, climate finance is our financial resources that are flowing from developed to developing countries for climate action. This includes everything that, that developing countries can put out in their NDCs related to the implementation of the Paris Agreement or anything that's related to Article 4.1 when we talk about implementation of the Convention. And commitments coming from developed countries on finance have to provide new additional financial resources to meet agreed full costs incurred by developing countries. Now, new and additional has always been a difficult a uh, concept to negotiate because it implies not duplicating resources that are already being reported elsewhere. So resources that are being reported as ODA, as health, as any other kind of packages being reported also as climate finance makes in, in practice that they stop being new and additional. And my feeling now, this is the year where, where you hear that the 100 billion goal has been achieved. Now, what I asked myself when, when, when I heard this is the year is what happened two years ago, because the reports are two years old, what happened two years ago that created a lot of flows from developed countries to developing countries? And those are COVID-19 COVID recuperation packages. And I can speak from experience, we had some of those recuperation packages coming from, to my country, labeled as climate finance. And we're now, we're now seeing that reported as climate finance, but th this is something that's difficult to look at. We've also um, taken decisions that we would use official channels, including the funds, like the GCF, the Adaptation Fund, now the Loss and Damage Fund. But if you look again at the flows that are being reported from developed to developing countries yearly, these 100 billion, but also outside of those 100 billion, if you look at mobilizations, around 800 billion a year. Out of that, less than five, less than eight percent actually go through these funds. But again, we've taken decisions saying that a substantial amount of resources will go through the funds. And I always make the, the, the dumb um, comparison in saying if I had 800 friends and I had a birthday party and eight came to my birthday party, I'm not sure I would be able to say that a substantial amount of my friends came to my birthday party because I had 800. But again, we're having those, those, those problems in reality. And, and the last thing that I want to put out there is we've taken many decisions on balance of resources. So balance between mitigation and adaptation and in, in line with the needs of developing countries. And, and you'll hear from last year, we have a goal of, of doubling adaptation finance. But what the SCF said on how much adaptation finance is actually part of the, of the global climate finance scenario is less than 10%. So if we double that, and it sounds like a very ambitious objective, if we double that, then we're aiming for 20%. This new objective of adaptation finance is less ambitious than the one we had forever, which was the balance between mitigation and adaptation. 
but we're being sold that as, as a great achievement and we'll have conversations as to how big that achievement is. Um, now just to go into the actual issues that Mina invited, to, invited me to, to speak about. And I'll begin with the loss and damage fund. Um, we saw yesterday at, at, the, at the COP plenary that we adopted a decision to, to operationalize the loss and damage fund. It took a lot of work from the members of the transitional committee to put that together. And, and honestly, it's not as bad a text as, as, as some would have it to be. Um, of course, the bigger preoccupation there from, from, from the global south and from developing countries is the involvement and the potential um, influence of the World Bank over the process. And the reason for this is not necessarily because of the nature of the World Bank itself, but, be, but because of the nature of loss and damage financing and the kind of experience that is required for loss and damage financing. In the finance world, we tend to fall to the, to the temptation of duplicating things that we've done in the past. And the way in which we've worked with the GCF, for instance, creating a board, then, taking, then having that board take almost five years to come up with their methodologies and the risk assessment indicators and, and so on for anyone to be able to apply it took them five years and then when you create a project for the GCF it takes another five years to access that project to, to, to get that funding going that's something that we cannot duplicate for loss and damage financing but we're more or less heading that way and it's it's a reality of the process because aside from creating a fund and from receiving pledges pledges are not are not actual deposits into the trust fund. We've, we've had pledges in the past that have been outstanding forever, like the pledge of the US to the GCF. The first pledge of two presidents ago never happened. But we'll, we'll see how, how it goes with the loss and damage fund. But the bigger issue for me personally in the loss, the loss and damage fund has to do with governance and with the capacity of the fund to improve its access to local communities. On the governance side of things, the fund has a 26 member uh, board now, which means 26 members, 26 alternate members, that's what, 50, sorry, I'm really bad with math, <laughs> 50, and, and I negotiate finance, 52, each with two advisors, which means 100 advisors and 50 members, it's 150 people board. Just imagine 150 people trying to look at this project by project and meeting every few months. For me, that's a bigger problem because loss and damage is, is, is very different from mitigation and adaptation in the sense that it has a life of death, a life or death urgency. And we'll see in, in practice what the loss and damage and the speed at which the loss and damage fund can respond to that. And the second preoccupation for me on the loss and damage fund has to do with the experience that is required. Honestly, the experience to work on loss and damage is closer, not equal, but closer to humanitarian aid than it is to traditional climate finance. But we've also decided that the fund will have an interim secretariat composed of people from very different secretaries that already have full-time jobs and that, of course, will, will imply that the fund will need some time to get it going and to have the people that have the experience to also provide technical assistance to, to on-the-ground loss and damage sites from funding for it, to make, for it to be completely operational. So those are the two bigger things that are pending in the next year for the loss and damage fund. So for the, for the board to have concrete conversations as, as to how the trust fund that has already been created uh, will make it happen and we'll, we'll have access to, to local communities. And hopefully, and, and, and sorry for, for taking so long on this, but hopefully the loss and damage fund doesn't commit, for me, the biggest limitation in the GCF, which is that you need a signature from one person in the government to, 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 to forward a project to the GCF. And most projects that have been forwarded to the GCF are those that have been written by the government because they're the ones that sign it. So the GCF has, does not have the capacities 
to work with local communities or even local governments. It does not have the, the GCF works with national governments. But loss and damage will be very different in that. And just to- Andres, you have five more minutes. Thank you. I thought I had one, I was measuring myself. <laughs> okay, you've given me six. Now I'll go into NCQG. Now NCQG is a process and, and, and I hate that we create so many acronyms. I, the first time I thought, I, I, I heard NCQG, it cost it to roll off the tongue. But NCQG is a process that we agreed in the same decision that adopted the Paris Agreement, 1CP21. And we agreed that we would have a process to set up a new goal on climate finance. And by new, we meant a goal that would supersede, and it would, it would replace the goal that we have for 100 billion a year um, by 2020. Then it, it became 100 billion a year by 2025, and it's still not there. It, it, it's now there with the COVID-19 recuperation packages. Um, but the new goal opens up a conversation on two things, which is something that the previous goal didn't have. If you look at the previous goal, it's just a paragraph that repeats itself every year. It gets worse every year. Because the, the, first, the first iteration of this paragraph was 100 billion a year for the needs of developing countries. Then the next year was mobilizing 100 billion a year, and mobilizing is very different. The next year was mobilizing 100 billion a year from a wide variety of sources. And every year that, that list of wide variety of sources gets larger. So public, private, bilateral, multilateral markets, creative, magical sources, and so on. It, it'll, it'll get larger as it goes. The new goal opens up conversation on two things, on quantitative issues and on qualitative issues. And before I go into those two, um, just, just a quick anecdote. Before we took a decision in COP24 to begin this process of the NCQG, and, and hopefully some of you have that historical memory, but in 2017 and throughout 2018, no developed country wanted this to be a process. We asked for that to be a process because we knew it would be, it would be complicated, it would require participation from non-state stakeholders, it would require information that we currently didn't have like what were the quantifiable needs of developing countries? No developed country wanted that. And I was in an event a few months ago where the EU was saying, we're very happy we got the loss and damage fund. Everyone is happy after we take this, the decision, but before the decision, we, we know who were the ones opposing. The same thing happened with the NCQG. Now we have the NCQG and we're discussing those two things, quantitative and qualitative elements. Now on quantitative elements, we need to use official sources coming from developing countries. How much is it that, we, that they actually need? Those will come in, in the biennial transparency reports next year. But we have assessments on, on NDCs and the costs of NDCs. And we have the report coming from the Standing Committee on Finance on needs, financial needs in developing countries. And the report of the SCF speaks, about, it speaks of a value between five and $11 trillion to implement the NDCs which put out yearly is about 400 to 500 billion dollars a year. But the second thing that we're discussing around the NCQG, finally, is about the quality of finance. And for me, personally, that's the bigger thing. It's bigger than the issue of the number. The number will sadly be the result of a political meeting. But we have technical inputs to that meeting. But the, the quality of finance for me is the bigger thing there. Because when we speak about quality of finance, and you look at the numbers on finance, I was telling you that over 90% of finance goes to mitigation. What that means is that over 90, particularly, practically the same number, is reimbursable. It's external debt. So we're, we're, we're quantifying the outflow of those resources to developing countries, but we won't quantify the inflow back into developed countries. It, and that brings out a bigger question. Who is paying for climate action worldwide when, when most of climate finance that is being channeled is debt? And we're having a new wave of external debt to developing countries right now from climate action. We were just getting out of the debt from independence now we're getting into the new wave of, of climate debt. But we're having that conversation around quality. 
around instruments, around channels, and particularly if you'll hear, if, if you hear any of developed countries speaking in, in, in the context of NCQG or anything that has to do with finance, you, you'll hear the word private sector more, much more than you will hear anything on public. And the rhetoric there is that there's so little resources in, in the public sector that what little we have, we need to use to motivate the, the, the private sector to do something. But if, if that is the case, then the conversation should be at, okay, what do we do to motivate the private sector? And we haven't had that conversation. There's nothing that, that countries can do to motivate the private sector. We've been in panels with the private sector, and, and, and I admire the private sector's honesty in saying, we'll only finance things where we can get financial revenue. So you need to change something so that investments in the climate world can make financial revenue. If we don't have revenue, the private sector has no reason for being there. And, and in adaptation, it is much more difficult to get revenue than in mitigation. Andres, you have a few seconds left. I have a few seconds left. Um, just to, to end with a, a final reflection, and, and you'll hear in that rhetoric about the public-private the public -private sector, this mentioning of 2-1-C. 2-1-C is, is very complicated because it is an aspirational goal to, to channel all of our, imp, all of our um, investments, including what I pay for my mortgage in my house, as, as climate resilient resources. And that's fine. We, we should all do that, have all of our, inv our investments be as green as they can. But if we end up counting for all of that and, and putting a number on 2-1-C, then it's the same number as NCQG, and then there are no resources, there is no climate finance anymore. We just didn't, we're just doing an accounting game, and, and we're moving towards an accounting game where developing countries are the ones paying for climate change, are the ones acquiring debt, and developed countries are just washing their hands of everything that we've agreed on. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Sorry for taking so long, Mina. No, no, you, I'm so sorry, you don't have more time. <laughs> I think when it comes to the voices of developing countries, our side event should have three hours <laughs> from an equitable <laughs> time space. Um, it gives me really great pleasure to welcome um, our dearest friend and, um, and the Senor Diego Pacheco, um, who is from the plurinational state of Bolivia. And uh, he actually is the spokesperson for the like-minded developing countries. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, friends. Uh, good night. Well, uh, we have the real pleasure to, to be here with the Bolivian, with the Bolivian authorities. Well, the Vice President of Bolivia is here, Hilata Davicho Kwanka, and also uh, uh, the ministers. The Minister of Planning and Development is here. The Minister of Environment is here. And uh, also uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs is in this event. So uh, uh, yeah, the Bolivian government uh, is really uh, trying to uh, make a, a presence in this, uh, in this COP28. Uh, and well, as, as Mina said, uh, we are very uh, uh, proud, we are very proud, really, to be part of the like-minded uh, developing uh, countries uh, group. We think that, well, this group uh, really makes the difference in the negotiation process at the UNF Triple uh, uh, For Bolivia, well, it's, it's very key to, to really strengthen the the voice of the of the LMDC uh, to really uh, create a balance, a balance in this uh, very complex uh, process, trying to uh, reach a, a, a structural solutions to to the climate uh, crisis, but uh, taking fully into account the uh, uh, climate uh, justice, uh, fully into account 
to protect and to defend the integrity of uh, Mother Earth and also uh, fully take into account the, uh, the challenges that uh, means to uh, solve the climate crisis, but uh, at the same time uh, achieving a sustainable development and the uh, reduction of uh, uh, poverty and other uh, relevant issues, which is uh, also to uh, uh, create a, a world with a, a, a more equality and a, a fighting the divide between the north, the global north and the uh, global south, because well, uh, we, uh, uh, the, the, the climate crisis is really uh, uh, increasing the gap between the north and the south, the socioeconomic gap, the technological gap, and well, instead of uh, really working for a, a world with a more equality, well, we are increasing the gaps and the injustice in this, in this world. That's uh, what the LMDC is trying to, to do in this, uh, in this process. What is uh, the paradox of this process is that, well, we did have, in our understanding, a, a good convention. We already have a very good uh, UNFCCC uh, convention to fight the, the climate crisis. We already had a very good Kyoto Protocol also to, uh, uh, to fight the climate crisis. A protocol that, uh, and a convention that uh, uh, creates the scenario and put the rules of the game to, uh, to uh, 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 solve to solve the, the crisis 30 years ago, establishing clearly the legal uh, obligations and commitments of the countries to solve the climate crisis, uh, uh, defining that uh, developed countries have uh, uh, obligations to uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, the uh, uh, greenhouse gases, and to provide finance to uh, developing countries also to uh, address the, the, the climate crisis. That's, that's the scope, that's the scheme of the uh, UNFCCC. And well, uh, developing countries also uh, were invited to, uh, to uh, 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 make all the needed efforts to uh, combat the climate crisis, but commensurate, contingent upon the provision of finance, technology transfer, and capacity building. It was a very good uh, agreement, a, a good understanding how to fight the climate crisis. That uh, uh, has, of course, a, 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 a responsibility, the responsibility of Annex I countries to address the, the crisis. And the Paris Agreement, we spent a lot of time a lot of efforts from developing countries to reshape the understanding how we should try to solve the, uh, the climate crisis, uh, bringing the concerns of developed uh, countries at that time. Developed countries that uh, started challenging the, the, the convention and the understanding of the convention how to deal with the climate crisis. And we did agree, we did agree to do that and to uh, some extent to uh, reshape the uh, rules of the game to solve the climate crisis. And we spent, I think, a decade, more than five years in, in a very tough uh, negotiations to uh, introduce the concerns of developed uh, countries to address this, uh, this crisis. And in the, that context, well, we recall also the uh, 20, well, the, uh, well, the, the, the Copenhagen uh, COP, uh, in which, well, developed countries offered, offered the 100 billion by 2020 in order to move, to move the behavior and the, a, to create a positive attitude of developing countries to engage in this uh, negotiation of the new deal, the new agreement uh, uh, that will end in, in, in Paris. And we did engage, 
completely, absolutely, and that was really the the a, a, a scenario also for the establishment of the of the LMDC in 2013, I think. 20, yeah, in 2013, really to go uh, with a common position with other countries to uh, to achieve this new uh, this new uh, agreement. And with the 100 billion in mind, we engage fully uh, towards uh, having the what now is called the, the Paris Agreement. And we were, to some extent, uh, comfortable with the outcome of, of the Paris Agreement. And the, the Bolivian government, uh, in fact, we did approve a, a national law to uh, reinforce uh, our agreement with, uh, with uh, the Paris uh, Agreement. We, did have, uh, we have this national law supporting the, the Paris uh, Agreement. And we were very well prepared to go into the implementation of the Paris uh, uh, Agreement. And we, well, we wait for, uh, and also we engage very much in the negotiation process uh, for uh, shaping the uh, methodologies, procedures, or whatever to implement the Paris Agreement. But we have a new surprise in Glasgow. The Glasgow COP, I think, is a a new attempt of developed countries to reshape, to reinterpret, or to rewrite the, the Paris Agreement. It was really a surprise for us to have a discovered decision trying to replace what we did agree in Paris. A covered decision rewriting and reinterpreting the, the Paris Agreement. That was really a, a very bad surprise because instead of a really moving all the spirit of the world, all the spirit of developed countries, all the spirit of developing countries for the implementation of the Paris Agreement to really move a, a, the solution that we did achieve after a, more than five years of, a, a, of hard work, of very tough a negotiation process. Instead of doing that, the developed countries open again the discussion that uh, how we should uh, try to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And in that context, well, Bolivia has a, a, an interpretation of this. For Bolivia, the, the Glasgow Climate Pact is the uh, new beginning of the uh, recolonization of the world. What does it mean? It means that, well, developed countries uh, are taking advantage of the climate crisis in order to impose new rules uh, for uh, how the world should behave uh, uh, following the rules of the North. We are not following the rules of the South. We are following the rules of the North, taking of, uh, control again the agenda of the negotiation process and imposing a new package, the Glasgow package, the Glasgow neo-colonial package to deal with the climate crisis. Uh, wh what is the package? It really means reinterpreting the Paris Agreement. In the Paris Agreement, we did uh, agree to uh, have uh, uh, to achieve the, and to reach the net uh, uh, the neutral balance of carbon uh, in the second uh, uh, half of this century. In the Glasgow Climate Pact, well, there is no this interpretation again, and there is the new goal, the new uh, uh, trying to impose a similar goal for all countries to achieve net zero by 2050 for all for developed countries and for developing countries. For Germany, for US, for Japan, the same goal that uh, for uh, developing countries, like Bolivia, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, whatever. So a similar goal for all. And we think this is against the climate justice, against the Paris Agreement. We cannot really support having a similar goal to uh, reach the net zero by 2050 for all countries. It's really against the, the, what did he, what did he agree in, in, in Paris. Also this idea of imposing the peaking by 2025 for all countries. That is not in the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement said, well, the peaking will be done uh, sooner by developed countries and later on for developing countries. So why this idea of having a similar picking for all countries in 2025? 
and also bringing, bringing the science of the IPCC, um, a very uh, twisted uh, interpretation of the IPCC uh, science, saying that the IPCC said that, well, all countries should uh, have the goal of 43% of reduction by 2030, and 60% of reduction by 2035. And now the IPCC science is the new religion. If we are challenging the IPCC science, we are the heretic of the world. <laughs> What's that? It really means even bringing the idea of science as the new religion, and a science that is against equity. Professor Jayaraman and Tijal are really challenging the issue that the IPC science is based on a scenarios that are already considering equity uh, and CBDR and, and closing the gaps between the North and the Global South. No, the, the science of the IPCC is based on trajectories that are really maintaining the, the inequalities in the world. The lack of access of developing countries to, uh, to services, to basic services. And that's the science that, well, developed countries are really trying to impose to, uh, to the world and to the uh, UNFCCC negotiations. And that's why the LMDC said that, that that's, not, no, that's not the right way. And we are just a, a very strong saying that we should uh, uh, defend fully defend the principles of equity and CBDR. It's not new, it is in, in, in the convention, it's in the Paris Agreement. But now we have a, a group of developed countries saying, saying that more capitalism is the solution to solve the, 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 the problems that stem from capitalism. More markets are the solution to solve the problems that stem from, from markets. More inequality is the way forward to solve the problems of inequality in the world. That means deleting, eroding the principles of equity and CBDR means having a scenario with no equity in the world, and that's the solution to solve the problems of the climate uh, crisis. And the LMDC is saying, no, that's not the way forward. The way forward is to achieve decisions taking fully into account equity and CBDR in the world. Before the developed countries challenged the previous agreement, maybe each 10 years, more or less, they said, OK, we have a new problems, a new scenarios, new understanding. Let's make a new deal. OK. Later on was every five years since Glasgow, Developed countries are challenging the agreements each year, and even each session, and even in each agenda discussion, they are really challenging what we did agree in the previous session. In each meeting, they are challenging what we did agree in the previous sessions and trying to reshape again all the understanding in order to introduce this idea of targets, sectoral targets, goals by 2050, goals by 2030, goals by 2035, the peaking. And in addition, we have a new, very creative surprise, which is aligning the financing through the 2.1C, maybe Andres explained this, aligning the finance to the way to escape out from their responsibilities. <laughs> the 2.1c is really the way how they are really trying to transfer the legal responsibilities or commitment from developed countries to the develop developing world, to the private sector, to the markets, to the reforms to, of the multilateral banks, challenging the responsibilities to now to the multilateral development banks, we really means transferring, shifting away from the responsibilities and moving the responsibilities to the shoulders of the, 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 the developing countries. Give you one more minute. And in the additional minute, <laughs> I want to say that Bolivia really worked very hard the last decade, trying to create a new pathway, a new pathway to 
uh, fight against these capitalist solutions, the market solutions. We work very hard having decisions on J-mitigation adaptation, alternative to Red Plus. We do, we do work very hard having the 6.8 in the Paris Agreement, non-market-based approaches. A lot of things we did achieve in the context of the Paris Agreement, standalone decisions, and so on. And at the national level, also, we did a lot. We uh, did approve laws to create our national authority, plurinational authority of Mother Earth. We, we established a, the cross-cutting transversal issue of climate change into our national planning system to deal with the climate crisis through our planning, uh, sectoral and territorial planning. We did, op we did establish a fund, a national fund, to align our entities in order to, with some expectation at, the, at that time, to, that Bolivia will receive some funding to fight the climate crisis. And what happened? All the decisions were did approve in this context, which were mandatory to the Green Climate Fund, to the Standing Committee of Finance, to provide finance for geomitigation adaptation approaches, for non-market approaches. The board of the Green Climate Fund said, well, the, the, these uh, decisions of the COP are not compulsory. They are going to take into consideration. I, they didn't consider, and they didn't uh, provide any funding for Bolivia to solve the climate crisis. So who failed in this context? Bolivia failed or fail the UNFCCC, the International Cooperation, or the Green Climate Fund. And we are still waiting, and we are still fighting for having some funding for Bolivia in order to address several problems that we have there. The melting of glaciers, the loss and damages, access of water to, to the people, now the problems of uh, forest fires, the problems of, of, of the for how to deal with deforestation. But we cannot do, solve these problems alone. So we are still waiting, we are still fighting for a, a have the venues to have access to direct access funding through the entities, new entities, whatever, but we need international cooperation, we need finance to deal with the climate crisis in Bolivia, as it's happening in all the world. All the world is waiting, but we are very tired of waiting but we need finance in order to deal with the climate crisis and we need more justice in the world and we are going to continue fighting for the implementation of the Paris Agreement and each COP we are going to continue fighting for implementing the Paris Agreement, the UNFCCC, which means achieving some climate justice in the world. Thank you very much. Fred. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Senor Diego Pacheco, uh, for your powerful words and inspiration. Um, last but not least of all is Professor Dr. Jaya Raman, another very strong voice within the IPCC, as his fights, and also here. I think one of the things that we never talk about enough is adaptation. And so we were hoping that you can tell us more about um, adaptation and maladaptation and transformational adaptation. <laughs> and this. Please carry on. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, uh, honorable ministers of the uh, plurinational state of Bolivia, uh, Diego, good friend, Mina, uh, new and old friends on the dais. Uh, and uh, friends in the audience. Uh, I'm very happy to be at this seminar because for the last two years, just before every COP, I have spoken at a Bolivia seminar. So this year I was wondering how come I didn't get to speak at a Bolivia seminar, so now I've got my chance. So I have three years in a row that before every COP, I speak at a Bolivia seminar. <laughs> so, then uh, there are two items on the agenda before us at COP28 that are crucial. 
first is the global stock tick and the second is the progress of our work on the global goal on adaptation so in the time that i have i'll speak briefly about both obviously there is a lot of details and you know lot of technical arguments and you know going back and forth etc etc but actually when you look at it uh through the common lens that we have of equity climate justice and the principles of uh, cbdr and rc they are actually quite simple issues and what we have before us is very clear so let's begin with the global stock tick the global stock tick is meant to take stock every 5 years of the implementation of the paris agreement now of course they made the first stock take 3 years after we began implementation so that is fine because the paris agreement was signed in 2015 so then 5 years would have been 10 years so okay we start taking stock it also happens that the year we started the implementation of the paris agreement was the year of the covid pandemic and this pandemic ravaged our countries to various degrees and across the world for the next two years roughly and its economic impact and also social long term medical etc impacts continue to this day so here we are taking stock of what has happened and the first problem is that the developed countries tell us that we will begin thinking about this whole problem starting only from 2020 so we will not talk about the past why because to add insult to injury as we say in the english language that uh, they are saying that the paris agreement is something separate from the convention the united uh, united nations framework convention on climate change now there has to be something absurd about trying to pull this off on the entire world with everybody watching because all of you can open up the text of the paris agreement and right there up front somewhere in article 2 it says to implement the long term goals of the convention and in fact to be a member of the paris agreement you have to be a signatory to the convention so i mean there is some there has to be some another level <laughs> of you know a pulling a fast one okay you talk of transparency and trust oh the global stock take is a process that must you know have a course correction accountability you know inspire trust etc etc and here you are just misrepresenting what you agree to in black and white and signed on to it mind you of course in the united states of america the signature does not mean much because every time they have an election the rest of the world is wondering whether they are going still going to be in the agreement or they are going to leave it okay so that nobody talks of as climate governance problem governance problem is our countries okay so this is the new discourse so the first thing in the global stock take we need to tell the world clear and simple that the paris agreement did not start from just nowhere you can't build the first floor of a house go to the first floor and say well i did it without the second uh, the ground floor it doesn't make sense so what was it that happened when the paris agreement began the stark fact is 1.1 degrees or to be precise 1.07 degrees of uh, warming about pre industrial levels has already taken place 
This is more than two thirds of the way to the target of 1.5 degrees. So if you want to come and talk about the implementation of the Paris Agreement, who is responsible for this 1.1? Now this is like saying, you know, the in, uh, I don't know if the parallel in Spanish, but in English you have the saying, the straw that broke the camel's back. It works in Dubai, no? We have the desert <laughs> around us. So the straw that broke the camel's back. You know the story, no? The camel is overloaded, overloaded, <laughs> overloaded, and then that last straw that you put breaks the camel's back, and you say, well, the straw is responsible. <laughs> And that's exactly the story we are dealing with in the GST. So the first thing is to acknowledge, you know, we talk about pre-2020, CBDRRC, historical responsibility, are we legally culpable? Forget all this. How did we get here? And why did we get here? Okay? This is the question you have to answer. And it is clear, 1.1, we need to know how we got here to 1.1. Underlying this is another story which they call ratcheting ambition. Okay, so the story of the Paris Agreement is that you are supposed to take stock. See, in the beginning, you're, everybody makes voluntary uh, agreements. So we are all going to promise what we will do. Then the scientists will go away, tell us what is the consequences of what we are doing. And then we are all going to decide, oh, we've got to do better. Why can't you decide to do better in the beginning in keeping with your responsibility is a different question, okay? So, but now we are going to do better. So in this, they call it ratcheting ambition. Now, the assumption of this language, especially from the developed countries, is that we are all doing things quite well in the right direction. All we have to do is to do more of the same. So if you are trying to reduce energy by, uh, you know, emissions by 10%, then you have to go to 20%. If you have to increase renewable energy, you were increased it by 100 gigawatts, now you are going to increase it by 300 gigawatts, triple. So basically you do whatever you are doing, but you have to do more of it. Now you take a look at the emissions reduction of the developed countries and you wonder what it is that they are doing right. So we have the synthesis report of the emissions of the developed countries which are available today, which have been reported by the UNFCC and reported based on the data that the developed countries themselves have given to the UNFCC. And what does it show? That he annex the, so, so you see the developed countries have two blocks in the UNFCC. There are the countries of the old Soviet bloc, as we used to call it uh, casually. It's called economies in transition. And then you have the original OECD countries, which together made up what's called the annex one. So the, or, or, incidentally, they don't even like the language and X1. Huh? So that's a different way. But anyway, so you have this. So the OE, old OECD countries, their reduction in emissions, the latest figure is they have reduced it by something like 7%. If you don't take account of uh, from 1990, 7%. And you are trying to tell us that you are doing it right, that all we require is more ambition and that we have to do whatever you are doing, but simply more of it. This is simply not going to work. Do you have public transport? No. For 15, 20 years, environmental activists all over the world told the world that the way to avoid pollution, emissions, use of oil and gas, whatever, is to shift to public transport. Today, I'm sorry to say, even in the developing world, all of us are captivated by the idea of electric vehicles. Yeah. So that's ratcheting emission. You have more cars. It's simply that they will run on electricity and not oil and gas. 
and reproducing all the problems. And these are the solutions we are supposed to accept. So climate finance, their whole vision of what is to be the future, the scenarios they make are all underlined by this mentality. So we must assert in the GST that the forward-looking vision must be on the vision of developing countries, the way they want to develop, and we must be free to pursue low-carbon development based on a fair share of the carbon budget. Five minutes left. Ha! Huh. So I'm not going to do adaptation. Very well, let's see. <laughs> so, but I'll, but, so the carbon budget is uh, another word that is very disliked. So there are a list of things they don't like. One is historical responsibility and fair share of the global carbon budget. But without, uh, so what we are saying is give us a fair share of the global carbon budget. And I'm very happy to uh, announce uh, since uh, we are part of the LMDC, that today Prime Minister Modi, in his high-level statement, in the opening of the high-level segment, said very clearly that one of the principles we expect is that every country has a right to a fair share of the global carbon budget. So we have it out there in principle. So this is the second thing one we need from the GST. Now, just to make up for the, uh, we don't have too much time, the other thing is finance, and I think uh, Andres and uh, uh, Diego have uh, spoken about it at length. So the third point that the GST must make, uh, the global stock take must make, is the need for finance. So it's always an ambition. Oh, will you do? What will you do? So we, we, we want to ratchet this up. We want to do more of this. We want to do more of that. So, you know, and uh, what about feasibility? That's a separate question. So it's like saying, you know, I want to come to COP28 and I'm in Chennai, which is south of India, which is not too far away. So the fastest way to get there is to have breakfast and fly a private jet down. Okay? Now, of course, that's ambitious, but I don't have the money to do it, you know? So what is this ambition that takes place without money, without anything to back it up? So if you have a target, tell us next to it what is going to be our uh, finance. What does it cost and who is going to foot the bill? The banks know this, as you pointed out. The other thing we need to do both in the GST and in this case is turn our attention to adaptation. 1.1 degrees is here. We need to adapt. What we cannot do by way of adaptation will result in loss and damage. Okay? And of course we have a fund, we are all very happy, but you should see who promised uh, how much in terms of money, and that is really laughable, okay? The rich of the world are so stingy, and it is newly sort of emerging economies that are doing something or will eventually put the bill. But that apart, loss and damage apart, adaptation is a necessity. Adaptation for us now is a double whammy, a double problem. Because we are countries for a whole lot of reasons, which I can, of course, cannot explain all in detail, but we have development on our agenda. And this is not something we can say, oh, we have achieved this, we are a developed country. All of us, and this applies to 80% of the world, cannot be considered about, you know, the population of Annex 1 countries is 17% of global population. The rest of all of us are developing. The bottom 50% of the emitters of the world earn less than $3 US dollars in uh, PPP terms per uh, person per day. So this is the kind of people we are talking about. These are people who are not responsible for the emissions because they contribute this 50%, only 13 to 50% of annual emissions. 
And if you take global cumulative emissions, it will be even less. For them, adaptation is the first and foremost necessity. We have turned our backs on adaptation. Adaptation finance is a joke till we got the fight going on uh, finance in the this thing. Adaptation finance used to come from the proceeds of the CDM. It is basically... We are supposed to end. Yeah. So it is our money earned through carbon credits in terms of uh, the Kyoto Protocol arrangements that provided for uh, adaptation. So we need adaptation finance. And don't tell us, and this is what really gets me, and I, we will end, uh, I'll end on this point, this whole talk of transformational adaptation. And it is amazing if you look up the uh, definition of transformational adaptation in the IPCC, what they tell us is preparing the, so changing the social and economic structures of society to respond to climate change. Who, me? I mean, in South Asia, 4% of global cumulative emissions with 17% of the population. If you had my per capita emissions, we wouldn't have a climate crisis at all. <laughs> and then you create the problem. And all this bunch of academics coming from the Western world, I'm sorry to say, let me be frank about it, tell us I have to change my society, my social and economic, not just economic, mind you, my social uh, arrangement in order to cope with your emissions. I mean, that beggars the imagination. We, okay, we, you want an assurance, we'll assure you we won't follow your path. First of all, because we can't do it, there ain't no global carbon budget left. Yeah. Second of all, we don't have the money to throw around like you did and all your colonialism, etc. of the past. So don't worry, we won't follow your path because it's not possible, nobody can do your thing. So don't talk to us about transformational adaptation. And maladaptation? So no maladaptation in the Western world. There's some exa one example from Australia, one example from something. So, so like our analysis of scenarios, we have been uh, analyzing all the examples in the IPCC. We'll come out with a report very shortly. And all of the examples are from the global south. So what is the definition of maladaptation? There should be no increase in emission. So how do I build a houses to protect people from extreme weather if I cannot have any emissions at all? Concrete is made out of what? Thin air? <laughs> so this is the story. So we need a sensible framework, an equitable, just framework a non-prescriptive, party-driven, party-implemented process that promotes adaptation across the world, backed by adequate provision of finance, technology, and knowledge, which is very important, and the capacity to cope with the future. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really, I, I really apologize.